Well, let's roll up at it right. He said, this is a nation, this, this nation is an insane asylum run by the inmates. <laughs> Hebrews 13, verse 20. <clears throat> now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Turn a few pages, 1 Peter chapter 5. God make you perfect to do his will. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us un unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you, God, for dying for our sins, paying for our sins, because we could have done it anyway. Yeah, but keeping us out of hell, preserving us for heaven. And Lord, what a good God you are, a great God you are. Uh, it's a great God just in keeping us saved, even though we haul around this identity nature with us all the time. Uh, Father, I pray you bless as we look into your word as some, some things about uh, our Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> And I forgot to make a let me say in passing, appreciate the visitors being with us today. Yes. Amen. Now, we are responsible as Christians to live a life consistent with our Christianity, consistent with our God, with what He wants us to be, consistent with the great name of the one that, uh, whose name we bear, Christian, Christ-like one. Stories told about Alexander the Great, he was, and he was a great military leader. He he solidified the city-states of Greece and made it one, one collective nation. And then with that nation, he defeated the Persian Empire completely that had previously competed, defeated the Babylonian Empire and so on. So he's a great military leader. Uh, other things about him weren't so great, but he's great about that. But one of, his, uh, one of his men deserted the army, and they caught him, brought him back, and he was going to stand trial, court-martial, and so on. And he stood before Alexander the Great, and Alexander says to him, he says, what is your name? And he said, Alexander, sir. Uh, and so Alexander says to him, he said, change your name or mend your manners. What's he saying? You bear the name of your commander-in-chief, act like it. We bear the name of our commander-in-chief, we need to act like it. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, we're going to act Christian in everything that we uh, do. Um, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Now what I'm talking about this morning is having perfect victory as Christians. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Prisoner. Now I had a, I had a, a chaplain tell me one time in a prison. He said, uh, he said after seven years inmates become in institutionalized. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, they're told when to get up, they're told when to go to bed, they're told when to eat, they're told when to take a bath, they're told when to go to the bathroom, they're told when to work, and all that. And he says, by the time they've been there seven years, they can no longer think for themselves because they're so used to somebody ordering their life 24 hours a day. Paul said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. We should get institutionalized as Christians to where we don't think for ourselves anymore, but we think what God wants us to think, and we act on what God has to say, telling us when to get up, when to go to bed, when to eat, when to do this, when to do that, and listen to the Lord and follow His leading on it. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that's an old English word, means to beg somebody, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. What is that? I'm called to be a Christian, called to be a Christ-like one. Somebody asked a man one time, <clears throat> so what do you do for, what, what, what are you, what's your vocation so on? He said, well, I work to, to make money so I can live for God. That's my vocation. Do what God put me here to do, and my job is just a sideline so I can put food on the table and so on like that. And that's the way it should be with us. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, that's called humility, with long suffering, suffering long, uh, tolerating the situations in life where we ought to face those things, forbearing one another, and even as children of God, we have to put up with each other to a degree, we have to put up with the nonsense that uh, different Christians have and, and their quirks and idiosyncrasies and all that kind of stuff. But notice what he says, forbear one another in love. We 
forbear each other because we love each other. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. A platoon sergeant can keep the unity in his platoon, but he doesn't do it in the bond of peace. He does it in the, in the bond of telling them what to do and making sure they do it and making them do what they're supposed to be uh, doing. But we're supposed to keep the unity in the, in the bond of uh, peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God, Jesus said. Verse 4, there's one body, the body of Christ, one spirit, the Holy Spirit, even as you're called into one hope, the hope of the soon return of Jesus, of your calling, one Lord, Jesus Christ, one faith, Christianity, one baptism, baptism of the Spirit, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Seven ones in verses four through six. Perfect unity from verse three. If all those seven things are working uh, in unison like they should be. Verse seven. But unto every one of us. Can you see an exception to that? No exceptions. Every single Christian. Unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now what's that gift given for? Somebody tell me what God, the Holy Spirit gives you a gift for. A spiritual gift. They had to find the saints to build up the church and all that. Build up the saints of God. And so to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Whatever your gift is, you're given the grace to that measure to fulfill that gift to edify the saints of God. Don't turn there, but Colossians 1.10 says that you might walk worthy of the Lord. We're supposed to do that all the time, right? Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Revelation 4.11, you were put here for His pleasure. No other reason that you're on the planet at all. You're here for the pleasure of the Lord who created you. So we're to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful. John 15 talks about that, degrees of fruitfulness. He says uh, you can bear fruit or much fruit, more fruit or much fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold, so on. Being fruitful in every good work. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells you how to be saved. Verse 10 says you, you're uh, saved to work, do good works for the Lord. Uh, he's, which he had before ordained, you should walk in it. Why should we do those good works? Uh, Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, said uh, so that let your light so shine before me and may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. They might not want your Jesus, they might not want your Christianity, but they see you serving the Lord from your heart, your mind, they know you mean business about it, you're serious about it, and they might not want it, but they would have to say, there goes a real Christian, somebody who loves the Lord. And so he says, uh, being fruitful in every good work, uh, how's that verse continue? And, in, and increasing uh, in the knowledge of God, learning more and more about the Lord Himself. Second Corinthians, Second Peter three eighteen, growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Always growing in the Lord. This Christian thing is a growth process. You never get grown. This side of getting caught out of here. Never, never reach full maturity. Even Paul, I've not attained to that which I've not apprehended that for which I'm apprehended of. And so it's a growth process in our whole Christian life, serving the Lord, learning more about Him and applying more of his word in our life as we go along. Now, we'll give you an acrostic with the word victory. So the outline is simply V-I-C-T-O-R-Y, and uh, so there's seven points there, and Lord willing, we'll hit them all and see what's, what we've got to say about this. I'm going to have a perfect victory in the Lord as children of God, living like he wants us to live all the time. Let me say number one, he'll give you victory over viciousness. What is that? That's gossip. That's having a vindictive spirit. We talked about that some in Sunday school this morning. Hatred and all that kind of stuff. What's the solution for that kind of attitude? It's charity. Amen. First Peter 4 verse 8, Above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. Why? For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. If you love people to help you overlook a lot of things in their life. Amen. Now the Lord's not saying you condone gross sin or anything like that. Uh, but you don't um, you don't rail the person, you don't beat the person up, you don't uh, kick them out, all that kind of stuff. You try to help them. Galatians six one, right? Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Proverbs seventeen nine says, "He that covereth a transgression seeketh love." Well, that's what we read in Ephesians four uh, just a minute ago. Uh, Forbearing one another in love. So you cover that transgression. You're seeking love with that person. But he that repeated the matter separated very friends. If you make it a matter of gossip, you just destroy the friendship and all that. We're to uh, we're to uh, forbear one another in love, and that will give us victory over our attitude toward other people, an attitude of viciousness. Number two, victory over insurrection. So what's that? Well, that's, that's rebellion, okay? Rebellion against authority, rejection of authority, 
disunity. We maintain the unity in the spirit. Remember, we read that a minute ago. Uh, it's mutiny uh, in the house of God. It's a spy in the camp, that kind of stuff. And the solution to that is simply submission. <coughs> submit. 1 Peter 5, verse 5, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. We can turn that around without doing any damage to the scripture. You elder, submit yourself to the younger. So how can you turn it around? In the same verse, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. All of us are to, to be in an attitude of humility, not cockiness, not full of ourselves, all that kind of stuff, have, have bad attitudes toward each other. Romans 12, verse 10, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. God is opposed to cliques in his family. And in the church. He doesn't like that at all. One little group over here. We're not having anything to do with that group over there. God is appalled by that stuff. The Holy Spirit is grieved by that stuff. We ought to all love each other the same. Just like you parents and your kids. You, should, you treat each child different because they are different. But you love them all the same. And we're to do that with the children of God. Kindly affection one toward another. And honor preferring one another. In Ephesians 5 verse 21 he says. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. God, submitting yourselves one to another. Jesus talks about out of the mouths of babes. He talks about wisdom coming forth or sometime. And some people are so cocky they won't listen to anybody younger than them or anything like that. that what do you know, kid? Well, they might know more than you do on a given situation. Amen. So submit yourself. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through vain, strive for vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. There's that humility again. Let each esteem other what? better than Amen. themselves. You know what that means? That means if i got the right attitude with God, everybody sitting here is better than I am. Everybody. And also I have a that too. That will keep us from having uh, uh, holding vendettas against each other and uh, all that gossip, all that back, all that nonsense, all that childish thumb-sucking stuff that Christians do. Amen. Uh, Martin Luther had it right. He said the church fathers ought to be called the church babies. And sure enough, that's the case sometimes. I ought to call the auditorium the nursery sometimes. Number three. We have fun yet? Well, we're going to. Just hang on. <laughs> Victory over callousness. Callousness. Hard-heartedness. Coldness. Uncaring. Just a don't care attitude. Unfeeling. You realize human nature is to see people hurt? You understand that? We are no different today in heart and mind than the Romans were in the days of the gladiators when they'd fill that coliseum with 20,000 people just to watch people go down there and chop each other to bits and kill each other and all that kind of stuff. We're no different. Why don't people watch, uh, watch NASCAR races hoping somebody wreck the car and get killed in it? Why don't people watch football games hoping the team would get a, in a fight out there on the field? Why don't people watch hockey hoping the puck would hit somebody in the face and bust all his teeth out? We like stuff like that in our old nature. That's why when you're driving down the road and you see a bad wreck, you've got a rubber neck, you're going to see whose blood and guts is laying on this pavement out there. Amen. That's our own nature, not mine. Yes, it's yours. Part of the Word of God. We are defiled in our own nature. And we love to see people hurt in our own nature, as long as it's not us. Amen. I'm telling you, God wants to deliver us from that kind of attitude. Why do you think boxing and stuff like that is such a Big sport and all that business that goes on, and all that stuff, wrestling, all that, even though wrestling's fake, and it's all, they watch all that stuff and hope somebody get hurt. Amen. I mean, you know, somebody gets, gets hit in the face and the blood spatters, the crowd goes wild. Why do they do that? Because they're just Romans sitting in the Coliseum watching people get killed, that's why. Same old stuff, same old thing. Violence has become a way of life in our society. You understand that? A whole lot of the movies are based on violence, video games based on violence, and kids grow up on that kind of stuff, and then you wonder why kids kill each other in the school. What was it last, was it last week some couple of people killed people in the school, one of them turned out to be a girl? What in the world's going on? Amen. I'm telling you, the Lord will give you victory over callousness. Just don't care about how other people, what's going on in their lives. Ephesians 4, 29 and 32. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth with that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister, your words may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, every bit of it, 
and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be a kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's the attitude we ought to have toward anybody all the time. So the solution to being calloused is just kindness and tender heartedness, having the right attitude toward other people. And <clears throat> let me say number four. That's quite obvious we're going to get out of here in time for lunch. Amen. Are you glad about that? Number four, victory over troubles. All right. Listen, life, what did, what did Job say? Life's full of troubles and a spark fly, spark fly up. Man, man is born on a woman that's full of trouble in, in a few days and so on like that. Everybody's life has trials in it. Everybody's life has setbacks. The Lord didn't say that you wouldn't have any trouble when you got saved. In fact, Odds are your troubles increase when you get saved because now you've got the devil on your back as well as uh, the world and the flesh and all that stuff. And so the problems seem to increase. But the difference is, uh, the solution to that is joy, the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. And that's not the same as happiness. Happiness and joy are not the same thing. Joy is something in the heart. Happiness is an attitude. It's a feeling. Okay, something going on, you're happy about that right now, you're grinning from here to here and all that stuff, but that might be gone in a few minutes. But joy is something that stays put if you allow it. That's what Romans 8, 28 is all about. That has to do with the joy of the Lord. You know, if you've got the joy of the Lord, you know this problem's going to work out for you good. You know you're going to come out on the other end unscathed by the situation. But if you're not walking with the Lord, you might not know that. You might fall apart. You might lose your Christianity over the troubles that come your way in life. And let's be honest, some troubles are very heavy. Very heavy. Victory over troubles. Hebrews 12 verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Brother Natural sing about that a few minutes ago. Uh, about the Lord paying for our sins and all that. Now, he, he despised the cross. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He did not like that. He despised what he had to go through. But he, Romans 8, 28, the life of Jesus Christ. And you on the other end of that thing. He was going to get great blessings from his Father. And that's what we need. He said, for the joy that was set before him. When, when David sinned, you know what he lost? He lost the joy of salvation. And in his prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, verse 12, he says, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Lord, I've lost that joy that's gone because of sin. Would you please let me have it back? And so that's, a, that's, a, the, that's the solution to troubles in our life is the joy of the Lord. You ever read about Joseph? Boy, what a character. Joseph spent 13 years as a, a slave. He was in prison, he was a slave in this place and that place, all that kind of stuff. But everywhere he was, the Bible says the Lord blessed him. Why? He kept his heart right with God. He had the joy of the Lord uh, there in his heart. He told that baker or butler, whichever one it was, uh, uh, the butler is the one that was going to have his position restored to Pharaoh. And he told him, he said, don't forgive me when you get out. He said, I've been in this prison for years. Would you tell Pharaoh about me? It wasn't that he had lost his joy. He just wasn't happy where he was at. You can be unhappy where you have still have the joy of the Lord. You understand that? The joy of the Lord. What is that? That's something inside that says God's going to get me through this. I'm going to make it through this situation because God is with me. James 1 verse 12 says you get a crown for enduring temptation. What does that mean? Enduring. It means going through it unscathed. Going through it without destroying your Christianity. Without getting you mad at God and all that stuff. What do we have to get mad at God about? People get mad at God because he took this from him, took that from him, all that kind of stuff. Well, we need Job's opinion. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it's up to him. It's his business. It's his property anyway. It's not ours to start with. He'll give you victory over troubles if you'll just keep the joy of the Lord down in, in your heart. Keep trusting in him. James 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work in patience, but let patience have her Perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. What's he saying there? You let you let the patience of God rule in your heart, and you will not you you will not be upset about what you have, what you don't have, what you can get, what you can't get, any of that kind of stuff. You'll just be satisfied with whatever the Lord's got going on in your life. And He didn't promise us any kind of uh, wealth or anything like that, did He? Lord probably knows most of us who made us millionaires would squander it. And get out of his will. 
But he promised to take care of us. He promised to feed and clothe us, meet our needs. A lot of times what we think are needs in, in today's society, uh, we think they're necessities, and they're not because your great-grandma lived without them. But we think we can't do it. He'll give you victory over troubles in life, over the little setbacks that come our way. I say little, some of them are humongous. Yeah. Some of them are really big. But you buy way back in your life and so on. I had, a, I had a business partner one time back in the 70s, early 70s, uh, and he, he, in partnership partnership with business. He was claiming to be a Christian, you know, and so I figured this is okay, going to business with this guy. We did good for about three years, and then he bankrupted the company. Bankrupted the company, put me out of business, lost lost everything that year. So what did you do? I didn't quit going to church. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't bail out on God. Yeah. And I didn't miss a meal. Yeah. I mean, y'all can tell I never miss a meal anyway, right? The only meals I've ever missed in life are those I chose to miss. God takes care of me. He takes care of you if you let him. Amen. Let's say number five. <clears throat> Here's a 10 cent word. You probably can't even spell it. Victory over orneriness. <laughs> Being ornery. Amen. <laughs> so why'd you choose that word? It's the only one I could find for O in this, <laughs> this alliteration there. What does that mean? Ir irritable? Bad attitude. Amen. Rotten attitude. Chip on the shoulder. You ever see somebody like that? Just kind of daring you to knock the chip off? Mm. What's the solution? Just humble yourself. Amen. You're not what you think you are. Amen. Just, just full of gas, that's all. That's all we are without the Lord. Humble yourself. First Peter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Why? That he may exalt you in due time. The Lord said in the book of James, he said it's better uh, to, for you to <clears throat> go down, hold yourself, and have the master say, come up, than for you to come up and have the master say, go down. Amen. Humble yourself and God will exalt you in due time. James, uh, James 4 verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Now notice he said, in the sight of the Lord. You ever see somebody acting humble? You know they're not. Yeah. You know they're not. Well, the Lord knows. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Let it really be in your heart that you... Uh, what, what does that go back to a while ago? Esteem other better than yourself? Those are acts of humility. Mm -hmm. And that's the way kind of attitude was put out. Luke 18, verse 14, Jesus said, Everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Well, everybody wants to be exalted in one way or another. So God's, God's uh, remedy for that is humble yourself and let Him exalt you. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says we're to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and fear of God. Filthiness of the spirit, what, what, what's a one word that will identify that? How about pride? The word pride. Cleansing ourselves from pride. Hard to do, right? Because we've all got a big dose of it. We all think we're special. We all think we're somebody to be like to do all that kind of stuff. Full of pride. We really are, whether we want to admit it or not. And so uh, part of humility is, is uh, cleansing ourselves from that pride and humbling ourselves before the Lord. Amen. So victory over being ornery. Number six, victory over remorse, over forgiven sin, over guilt. Being eaten up with guilt over your past life. I, I, I've actually dealt with Christians, been saved 30 years, and they're still living before they got saved. What I did before I got saved, blah, blah, all that nonsense. Don't you realize that when the moment the Lord saved your soul, all that was washed away? He forgot about it? Amen. Because you're born again into His family, you're a new creature in Christ. All things are passed away, whether you pass away or not. Uh, behold, all things are become new. The Lord sees you uh, alive as from the day you got saved. Before that, you were dead in trespasses and sins. And so, uh, when, when a person just lives their life in guilt, oh, you don't know what, I've had Christians say, oh, God can't use me, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done, the Lord knows what you've done. And I realize some things we can do as human beings puts limitations on us in our service for the Lord. Amen. For example, you can't be living in adultery and God called you to, to preach. That ain't going to happen. And stuff like that. So there are limitations. But you can still, you can still get right with God. You can still get forgiveness through what? Repentance. 
and get right with God, and He can still bless and He can still use you to whatever degree uh, is allowable in that situation. Amen. What a good God we have, man. Good night. Look what He has to overlook sometimes. Look what He had to overlook to even go to the cross. You realize, I think it's Isaiah 42, talks about Jesus uh, healed the blind when He was here, but He was blind. He healed the deaf, but He was deaf. And the, the thing in the, in the text there is pointing out just the simple fact that he turned the deaf ear and turned the blind eye of what was going on so he could fulfill what he was here for. He was here to pay for their sins rather than judge them in their sins and put them in hell. He had to deafen his ear. He had to blind his eyes in order to do that. That 33 and a half years he was on this planet. And he said, he said our example, we can do that too, for real. Amen. Just uh, accept the fact the Lord forgave you and do your best for the Lord. He says in Ezra chapter 9, verse 6, <clears throat> he says, uh, he said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses grown up unto the heavens. Ezra is is uh, confessing the sin of his nation, what put them into captivity to start with, and the fact that now they're coming back to the promised land, some of them still uh, haven't changed a bit. They didn't learn anything from the chastening. Uh, he says, uh, we are uh, we're, uh, don't even have a right to lift up our face. We, we should blush because of our sin. You realize that's something missing in our society? When's the last time you saw somebody blush? Or well, we're doing something wrong. That's a rare thing. People do, do stuff, ungodly stuff, man. It doesn't, doesn't bother them at all. He said, I'm ashamed and, and blush to lift up my face to thee, O oh God. Uh, when we are in sin, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. But we get that thing right with God. God said he forgot it. I know we can't, but we don't have to dwell in it. We don't have to feel guilty anymore. You can embrace the fact that God has forgiven you of it. So when we repent, we confess our... Isn't that what 1 John 1.9 is about? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why can't we just accept that? I mean, Christians are coming to all over the same old sin that they committed way back and still keep coming. Lord, I hope you forgave me for that. Would you forgive? If you ask Him to, He did. That's what He said. Amen. Job chapter 22, starting in verse 21, just going to hit some highlights in, the, in these uh, few verses here. He says, acquaint now thyself with him, with God. Once you get to know God, once you get acquainted with him. You know how you get acquainted with God? Through his word. That's how you said, God said in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and so on. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. So you are to learn how God thinks. You can only learn that in here. Okay? So acquaint yourself <clears throat> with him and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. You get acquainted with God, be at peace with God, good will come to your life. The next verse he says, Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. What did God say? Whosoever shall call upon me uh, shall be saved. I call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Well, I call on the name of the Lord, so I'm saved. Why would you doubt your salvation then? You confess your sins, I forgive them. Well, I confess it, he forgave it. Why should you keep walking around under, under a dark cloud of guilt? That will destroy your Christian, Christian service. He says, receive uh, from his mouth and lay up his words in thine heart. Psalm 119, verse 11, thy word of it hid my heart that I might not sin against thee. The next verse, Job says, if, here's a conditional thing, if I return to the Almighty. What does that mean? Uh, he's just been talking about sin. It means repent. That's what. You return to God, you repent. Lord, I, I'm sorry I shouldn't have done that. I'm not going to do that. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. And in fact, thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense. He'll come to your rescue. Then, now notice says, if you'll get right with God, Job says, then shalt thou have thy delight in the Almighty and shalt lift up thy face unto God. That's in contrast to what Ezra said. Because of our iniquities, we're, we're, we're ashamed to lift up our face to you, God. But Job says, if you'll get things right with God, then you can lift up your face to him. And he says, you'll delight in the Almighty. Psalm 37, verse 4, delight the in the Lord, he'll give thee what? The desires of the heart. Amen. So, 
Uh, Job says, when you do that, if you do that, then shalt thou have delight in the Almighty, and shalt lift up thy face unto God, and thou shalt make thy prayer unto Him, and He shall hear thee. Once again, in a place of getting prayers answered, implication, you walk around into that guilt that you shouldn't have, you're still, you're still battling what you did that God's already forgiven and God's already forgotten. He said, you're going you're gonna to be hard-pressed to get your prayers answered. With that going on. Job 11, he says this, starting at verse 13. <clears throat> He says, if thou prepare thine heart, what does that mean? It means you get right with God. And stretch out thine hands toward him, pray. If iniquity be in thy hand, put it far away. Get the sin out of your life, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. In Romans 6, 12, he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. So Job says, hey, you get your heart right with God. You put sin out of your life. And then the next verse says, for then, when you've done that, then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot, Yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear, because thou shalt forget thy misery. You forget all about that sin that got you in trouble, that you were so miserable while, while, you, while God was dealing with your heart about that thing, and you asked God to forgive you, and he forgave you, so now you're going to shove it aside and forget about it as best as humanly possible to forget it. I know God can forget it. He, he, you know, he, he says he can forget it. We can't. It's still in that great matter somewhere, but you don't have to feel guilty about it. I tell you, hey, I don't feel about it. If you exercise 1 John 1, 9 in faith and God forgave you of it, when it comes to mind, you'll say, thank you, Lord, you forgave me for that one. Amen. Amen. I don't have to worry about that anymore. That's what it says. Because thou shalt forget thy misery, he goes on and says, thou shalt be secure. What is it with uh, some professing Christians think they can lose their salvation? They're not secure. They do something wrong. They hold. Did I lose it? Thou shalt be secure because there's hope. Thou shalt take thy rest in safety. Thou shalt lie down and none shall make thee afraid. So when the devil comes your way or somebody knows about your past, you know, and brings something up like that, you mean to tell me you're saved and after you did that? Well, yep, sure am. You put it away. None shall make thee afraid anymore. Christian says, well, I've done too much. God can't use me. That's not true. That's not true at all. He can use you. Amen. Can I say that your report card of the judgment seat of Christ is not going to be based on what you did before you got saved? At all. Nor is it going to be based on what you did after you got saved as long as you kept slate clean with God. Confess that sin, God's done away with it, it'll not show it to just in Christ. If it does show it, it's going to be as bad works. You weren't doing what God told you to do that day, and it's going to cost you rewards. Confess it, get rid of it. Let me say number seven in our acrostic. You'll have victory over, and this is the biggest of all, yourself. You are your biggest problem. If you're the biggest enemy that you have, and I'm the biggest enemy that I have. The victory over our pride, over our ego, our self-will, our self-satisfaction. Patting ourselves on the oh, I did look at what a good job I did there. Solution, give the Lord the preeminence in your life. Turn it all over to him. <coughs> Somebody says, oh, you did a great job. I said, yeah, I know, because the Lord enabled me to do that. It's all, it's all of him. Amen. Amen. Give him the preeminence. Put him ahead of yourself every day. What is Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 says the same thing. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the old, uh, 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 put on the new man. Put off the old man. Romans 13. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're to get up every morning and put him on. And put off this old Adamic nature. So you mean I wake up with that Adamic nature? Yeah, you probably have some dreams in the night you shouldn't have had. That's the Adamic nature coming forth. Amen. So... Uh, you need victory over yourself. You ever get victory over yourself, uh, the rest of life will be a breeze. Be, won't be a problem at all. Colossians 1.18, He, Jesus, is the head of the body of the church, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Practice the presence of Jesus Christ in your life every day. You know, back about 15, 20 years ago, they had these little wrist, rubber wristbands. What would Jesus do? You always wonder seeing somebody wear one of those things. Would they do what he did in whatever the situation is? Practice the presence of Jesus. Amen. Lord, what would you have me do in this situation? What would you do in this situation, Lord? John 3, verse 3. Uh, John the Baptist, he had it right. He, Jesus, must increase. I must decrease. 
I must become less and less of myself. Paul put it this way, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. It's all about him. Ain't nothing on this planet about you or me. Amen. It's all about him. You don't get that nailed down, your Christian life be what it ought to be. It'll be okay. And you won't have a problem getting along with brothers and sisters, all that stuff, everything flow just like it's supposed to flow. Say, so, well, you don't know what they said about me. I don't care. I don't care what they said about me. Just move on for the Lord. Don't get bent out of shape over stuff. Amen. Let the Lord take care of it. He's fully capable. Don't you think your God's able to take care of the situation? Huh. I mean, the one who created the world and the universe, could he take care of some little piddly stuff that goes on in our life? Absolutely. You get victory over yourself. That's what I want. Not my will, let be done. Even Jesus said that. Why, why should we? Amen. Victory over yourself, man. We cause ourselves so many problems in life that are unnecessary. Would never take place if Jesus had the preeminence. Never would. <clears throat> All right, so let's, uh, let's close this down here. Whatever God has delivered you from, through salvation, through forgiveness along the way, whatever it is, don't go back to it. Don't go back to it. He, he wants you to have victory every day in your life. Amen. Remember when Joshua, Joshua chapter 5, they get ready to cross the Jordan River and face their first battle, which would be Jericho. And there's a man standing there. And Joshua says, are you for us or against us? Who side are you and he says, I am the captain of the Lord's host. In other words, I'm Jesus. I'm here to help you with this stuff. We'll get you through it. God is a man of war, and so the Bible says. So you've got the same man for you that Joshua had for himself. The very same one. His name is Jesus, okay? He wants to, wants to fight our battles for us. He won't, listen, can I put it this way? He don't even play chess. He wants you to be a pawn on the board. And let him move you where he wants to move you and accomplish through you victory over the opponent, which in this case is the devil, okay? And your flesh and the world. And that's all God wants. Just, just be yielded. Uh, he calls us in Isaiah, we're, we're clay in the hands of the potter. Can the clay say to the potter, why hast thou made me thus? No, absolutely not. The potter's in control, not the clay. So we just need to give him the preeminence, yield to him, let him do what he wants to in our life, and not go back. You know what God told Joshua, Joshua chapter 1? He said, everywhere the sole of your foot steps, he's talking about coming into the promised land, I'll give it thee. Every, every place you set your foot. So we as Christians in a spiritual battle, every place we set our foot, every place we get some victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, don't give it back over to the devil. Don't back up from it. Amen. We've had Christians in this church, and I wouldn't doubt they were saved, but I could name uh, one, two, three, <coughs> three, four, at least four families over these 30 odd years that have left the church and they're now out there in the world living like hell. Okay? Put the Christianity told They don't want to say, you can't say that. Any of us can be in the same condition if we turn and walk away from the Lord. There's only two places to be in God's will or out in this world. That's why the Lord says if somebody won't do right as a Christian, uh, you uh, serve a fellowship with them that they may be ashamed. Why? They're a person with no country. They're out of sorts with the church, out of sorts with the world because they're saved and all that kind of stuff. Just a real problem. So if they're going to get out of the church, there's only one direction to go. Back out in the world. And most of us have seen that happen with people. Amen. He said, Joshua, don't give it back. I'm going to give it to you. Don't give it back. Sad thing in uh, Joshua and, and, and Judges, first few chapters of Judges, uh, the Lord said, I'm going to give it all to you. You get the Canaanites out of the land and the whole land's yours. They, they never did that. They didn't do that. It says in Joshua 1 again, I mean, Judges 1 and Judges 2, <clears throat> they had to have a battle with these Canaanites and those over there and they couldn't defeat them. And, and so they put them under tribute. That means they let them live among them and so on like that. And uh, that's one thing that got them centuries later. Got them carried into captivity in Babylon. And, and uh, 
the cereals. If God gives you an inch, keep it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. As I said in Sunday school this morning, I think, <clears throat> during Sunday school, you give the devil an inch, sooner or later he wants to be the ruler. He wants all 12 inches. Amen. Every bit of it. Don't do it. Don't go back. Where he's brought you to. That's what that's what John, uh, Peter was talking about in the verse we looked at to start with. He said that he may establish you, make you perfect in every good work. Get, you, get yourself established. You know what the psalmist said two times? He said, my heart is what? Fixed. I ain't going back. My heart's fixed. Come too far to turn back now. First Chronicles 29, verse 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, and the victory. Thine, O Lord, is the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. God's is the victory. It's his, and he's head over all, and he wants us to have victory in our daily living. He wants the church, as a church, to have victory. First Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay right with Jesus. You've got the victory. 1 John 5, 4, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The victory that overcometh the world. I don't know how long it lasts. You get things right today. It might last till this afternoon. It might last till next year. But when we're out of sorts with the Lord, these areas we talked about, these seven areas we talked about, viciousness, insurrection, callousness, Troubles, orneriness, remorse, yourself. Get it right with God. And then stay right as long as you keep it right. Victory over yourself. Let's bow for prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. The Lord wants you to have victory. And let's, let's just uh, be honest this morning. Not everybody sitting here has got victory in every area of life. And, and uh, some of the areas we talked about this morning. Why don't you go to the altar, quit being yourself for a minute, and be a Christian, a Christ-like one, and go to the altar and ask God to help you where you're shortchanging Him, where you're not having the victory like you ought to. And some are coming to the altar and it's open for you. I'm telling you, there's people in this church that haven't been to the altar in years. Some of them have never seen the altar. And all that tells me is you're a Laodicean Christian. You're going to do your thing. You don't care what God has to say about it. Amen. You want victory? Christian victory I'm talking about. Get up here and talk to God about it. He wants to listen. He wants to hear you. And he wants to do something about it. 